Gentlemen, uh, very nice to see you, Victor Sperandio and uh, Edwin Vieira here, the two uh, co-authors of the Crashmaker, uh, almost 1,500 page long book published in uh, 2000, dealing with the Federal Reserve, unstable financial system, gold. For old time's sake, why don't we just kick off talking about that book for a bit and recap themes that are still pertinent in uh, today's market and society. <coughs> All right, I'll just give you a, a prelude to this because I had developed an idea about this book and Edwin became my partner. <clears throat> this book is about a villain and it's written in a, it's a fictional book. And the villain is the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. And basically it tries to show in, in, in an allegoric form that this position uh, it is so powerful a position to give anybody uh, that if someone were in, very intelligent but yet corrupt, uh, they could do substantial harm to, if you use the example today, 317 million people with just one person. This is not the way the Constitution was written. Federal Reserve Act of 1913 is unconstitutional. I'm speaking to a constitutional lawyer here if you want to ask him that. But the point is, it, 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 the system we have is unconstitutional and it is potentially extremely corrupt. I mean, that's the bottom line of the book. It shows how it can be corrupted by a power lust chairman of the Fed. Okay, yeah, why don't we hand over to you, Edwin, and uh, let's talk a bit about the history and, and the founding of the Federal Reserve and also why it has led to many financial crises in the last 100 years. Well, although most people don't realize that the history of the Federal Reserve goes back really to the beginnings of this country and Alexander Hamilton's idea that you have to, or he wanted to, combine the big financial interests in the country with the U.S. Treasury so that the big financial interests would be in support of the new government. And that was the basis for his uh, assumption by the new federal government of the state you know, revolutionary war debts. So you had this kind of symbiotic, or I would call an incestuous relationship set up between bankers and financiers in the private sector on the one hand and the U.S. Treasury on the other. And that continues with the first bank of the United States. Which was the, a private bank. Which was a private bank, chartered by Congress, but Congress has the capability of chartering private uh, entities. And then the second bank of the United States, which resulted in the famous bank crisis with Andrew Jackson, where Jackson essentially defeated the bank. The bank lost its charter eventually. Uh, they tried to assassinate him. Okay, it was an attempt to assassinate him. <clears throat> then, of course, Civil War comes along, and Another one of these incestuous relationships was created in the National Currency Act, which created the national banking system, which is now part of the Federal Reserve. All of these national banks trace back to the Civil War legislation. Now, that system also had inherent instabilities to it, all based on fractional reserves. And in that particular case, it was tied to the amount of U.S. debt that existed. And at that time, the United States government and the people were not interested in expanding the debt. Bankers didn't like that. There were a number of uh, what they call panics, financial panics after the Civil War. Federal Reserve System is set up, again, on this same symbiotic relationship, the Treasury on the one side, the bankers on the other, in order to stabilize the entire system. But the system, those panics, they were ultimately credit-induced panics because of the fractional reserve system it had nothing to do with the gold standard, right? Well, if you interpreted them correctly, you would see that they were tied back to the profligacy of the banks. But the banker said, well, this is because we don't have a lender of last resort. If we had someone that could dump in liquidity when we have these stringencies because the fractional reserve system is, is, is collapsing, all that said sotto voce, if you know what I mean, if we had that kind of a system, then we could manage this scientifically. We would never have inflation. We would never have depression. All right, system comes in in 1913. That was the statute. Let's say 1914, it gets up and running in time for one, uh, World War I. The end of World War I, you have the first depression under the Federal Reserve, 1920, 21, 22. And also for the benefit of our readers, the U.S. went off the gold standard. And, uh, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. They stayed. No, they stayed. They, yeah, that's right. So not yet. The Europeans went off the gold standard. They did, but the United States didn't. Okay. 
Now comes the banking crisis after the 29 stock market collapse, 1931, 1932. This is the great collapse of the Federal Reserve System. Roosevelt comes in, seizes the gold from the American people, turns Federal Reserve notes into, into legal tender for the first time, <coughs> abrogates all of the gold clause contracts that existed, public or private. Right. So essentially, as they say, going off the gold standard, except internationally, because the Federal Reserve System continued to redeem currency internationally in order to have uh, proper f uh, foreign policy relationships. That's, that's April of 33. Yeah. But, but private citizens couldn't do right. that anymore. Okay. They couldn't even own that. Now comes World War II, huge influx of gold to this country. By the end of World War II, this country had the largest stock of gold, I believe, in the history of the world, as far as we know, oh. ever. How many tons do you know? Oh, let's see, it was like 350 tons or something like that, uh, close to 400 tons, 400 tons of gold. Yep. Because when Nixon cut off in 71, Gold Redemption Internationally, because there was a hemorrhaging of gold going out, especially to the French. You had Charles de Gaulle and Jacques Rueff, and they were gold bugs, and they were very concerned about they the expansion. That's to collect the gold. That's right? to collect the gold, that's right. So this gold was leaving, physically leaving. And in August of 71, Nixon and Connolly, who, John Connolly, who was Treasury Secretary, uh, cut off the redemption of gold. And at that point in time, I think there was about 260 million ounces of gold still, and they considered that to be about half of what had been the post, immediately post-World War II. So that was another crisis. So you had the crisis of 32, 33, then you had the crisis of 71, then we've had the crisis of 2008. Now we're beginning to go into another crisis, the crisis of 2014, 2015. Each one significantly worse than the one that preceded it. And each one, interestingly enough, without some kind of an anchor to slow it down. Because those first two in 21, 22, 32, there was a gold backing domestically and internationally. 71, there was a gold backing internationally. 2008, gold wasn't in the picture. And now, 2014, we have the example of the quantitative easings, the bailouts, the willingness to generate any amount of false liquidity tied to whom? Tied to the symbiotic partner, tied to the incestuous partner, the U.S. Treasury, and the US, ultimately the U.S. taxpayer or the U.S. citizen that suffers the same result through inflationary effects. So we've seen this policy. And I'm going to throw in interest rates at effectively at zero going on six years and will probably, according to Janet Yellen, be seven years at zero, which is effectively stealing from savings. Nice. Just so why is the Fed unconstitutional? You're a constitutional lawyer. Well, there are a number of reasons. First, if, if you look at the, the currency unit, the Constitution requires the currency unit to be a silver unit, the so-called dollar. That was the Spanish mill dollar. It was adopted by the Continental Congress. It was adopted by the Congress after the Constitution was ratified. It was, it was proposed by Thomas Jefferson, of all people. You can trace all of this back. There's no question as to what that was. And gold was to be also in the system in what I would call a duo-metallic system. The unit was silver, gold was to be measured in silver, but both of them were to circulate side by side. The problem was that banks came into this equation and banks that had significant political influence so they could tie themselves one way or another into U.S. Treasury. And the banks were operating on the fractional reserve principle and generating currency based upon debt, not upon actual gold or silver reserves. And this was the inherent instability in the system. So in other words, they lent out more money than they had backed by gold and silver. Yeah, they lent out more currency than they had real money in the vault. Exactly. Okay. And once the people wanted to redeem their currency, the banks faced uh, bankruptcy. It's the same. Story. That's right. And then they turned to the government and the initial step was what they called suspension of specie payments. The government said, well, you don't have to pay those notes. You don't have to redeem those currency notes for some period of time while you straighten out all of your other loan portfolio. Some of them, of course, went bust. Some of them didn't. But this was one special privilege of the government coming into play here to protect the private bankers. And this was already in the 1900s. This was in the yeah, 1820s, 1830s, before the U.S. Civil War. Then after the Civil War, the symbiotic relationship was the national banks would buy U.S. debt, hand that to the Treasury, and receive 90% of the face value of that debt and currency, which they could then loan out on the fractional reserve principle. Right? 
So they, there was a direct tie-in between the banks and the Treasury. Difficulty in that system was, at that time, the American people were not willing to tolerate an endless expansion of debt, so the bankers weren't able to increase the amount of currency and loans that they would like to have done. Federal Reserve solves that problem for them, but it still had, in its original formulation, a gold connection. So they had to get rid of that. And they got rid of that on the basis that there was an emergency that was caused by the failure of the system. It's incredible how people would accept this kind of reasoning. And twice, domestically and then internationally. Now, if you ask ultimately why it's constitutional, unconstitutional, it's because of that relationship in currency creation. But there's another reason. Roosevelt, in 19... Because Congress should create the money. Well, Congress is supposed to oversee the coinage. There's the, the dollar is supposed to be a coin, and gold is supposed to circulate in coinage form, or in bullion form, right. not in this credit form, debt credit form tied to the U.S. Treasury. Of course, we could have bills that would be redeemable for gold. Well, they had them, gold certificates, silver certificates, right? right? That would be constitutional. That's right. Well, yes, that would be constitutional, because those are receipts for pieces of metal that are actually held in a vault somewhere. Right. And if you look back historically, the Continental Congress during the War of Independence had the power to what they called emit bills. When the Constitution was being discussed, the first drafts, that power was in the draft, power to borrow money and emit bills. They had a debate and struck it out. And under our constitutional system, the only powers that Congress has are the ones that are given to it by the Constitution, delegated as, as the term is used. So if you see that they proposed to have the same power that the Articles of Confederation had, and they struck it out, it logically follows the power isn't there. There is no power to create paper currency of the debt-based variety in Congress. 